again, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just, I think things have gone so fast. You know, I like, I like to get more relaxed. I wish we had some more items so I could just relax a bit more, you know. <laughs> but um, it's great to be here with you in Bilston. It's wonderful. And um, I, I am in Reading in Berkshire, uh, but we're close and connected by this medium. It's wonderful. Um, what a week. What a week. What a past few weeks, you know. Right now, um, you know, my daughters went to this, uh, um, in Reading, they had this protest march yesterday in solidarity with events in America with um, for George Floyd. And, um, you know, I saw my daughters make these little placards, no peace. What, what is it? No, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. That's right. No justice, no peace. And, and, and Black Lives Matter. And they were out there, you know, 18 years old, 16 years old, holding up their placards. No justice, no peace. Yes. And uh, uh, how could a white police officer extinguish the life of a black man? No, no, I'm talking about what happened. Extinguish the life of a black man. Wasn't struggling, wasn't shooting them. No compassion. You know, Paul says, in the last days, perilous times will come. They will be without natural affection. The common, decent uh, compassion that a human would show for another suffering human will be dying out. That's what Paul is saying to us. You know, you, as well as I, listen to um, Reverend Al Sharpton speaking at in Minneapolis at the memorial for George Floyd, you know. And um, you heard uh, Al Sharpton say, you know, we need to get the knees off of our necks. And we need to get up and we need to act. And there's certain things, or there's certain uh, uh, experiences in life that shock us and that shock us into action. And um, that was one significant event. I don't know if it's going to change anything in America. I'm hoping that it does. Um, but right now, uh, we we want to be changed by the Lord who can change things. You know, there's a song that comes to my mind, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come off this uh, headset so I can talk to you directly. One moment. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I'm just gonna turn my volume up there with me a second. Uh, okay. So there's a song that comes to mind, and I think I'm just gonna play. Um, a few words of it, a bit of it right now. Because this is what I think the world needs. Remember that song? What the world needs is Jesus, just a glimpse of him. What the world needs is Jesus. Just a glimpse of him. He will bring joy and gladness. Take away sin and sadness. All the world needs is Jesus. Just a glimpse of him. Yes, yes. Man, we need another the glimpse of Jesus in this world. Police need to see him. Politicians need to see him. And we need to see him. Just another glimpse. Let's go to our scripture text. John chapter 5. And um, a fascinating story. John chapter 5. Did you know that, that um, in the book of John, it does not say that John wrote John? Yeah, we can't find it in the book of John that John, the apostle, wrote John. We have indicators in the book of John, and some theologians, some they call them scholars, some of them, in, particularly in the 19th century, they felt that John was not written by John. But we know that John was written by John. We could have a study on that a separate, at a separate time. I just need to ask, can you hear background noise coming through? Because there's a gale blowing through. You can't? No, everything sounds wonderful. Fine. I can hear it strong. I'm in my conservatory and I can hear the wind, the rain is lashing down. 
and um, my roof sometimes leaks. So if you see me get up and run, you know what happened, all right? So John chapter 5, John the Gospel was written by the Apostle John. I'm just going to share this. In 1935, prior to 1935, some biblical scholars believed that John was written round about AD 170. About 140 odd years after Christ. But in 1935, a small piece of papyrus was discovered in Egypt. Guys, can you hear me or am I frozen? I can hear you. Okay, good, good. I'm going to be, I have to check all these things because, you know, I'm not too far from my router, but, you know, we know the devil is a prince of the power of the air. So we need to keep praying as we preach. All right. So in 1935, uh, a, a piece of papyrus was discovered in Egypt. And on this piece of papyrus, there was written some verses from the Gospel of John. It was from chapter 18. Gospel of John, about four or five verses. And the verses, uh, they talk about um, Jesus being in front of Pilate and Pilate asking, what is truth? That's how the verse ends. What is truth? Previous verses on the papyrus talk about um, a, a Pilate saying to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? But in 1935, they found the papyrus and they dated the papyrus to the year AD 125. And so it was a, a copy, which meant the original, uh, it was copied from uh, maybe from a copy and an original had existed. And for the, uh, for the copies were made by hand and they wouldn't have copied a verse, they would have copied an entire section or text or book. And so it was concluded that the original copy of John was significantly written before 125 AD. So conservative scholars now believe that John was written round about AD 80, somewhere around there, 80 to 90. And we have it in our hands today as the gospel according to St. John. John chapter 5 obviously is preceded by the earlier chapters. And we are introduced to John in chapter one with John saying, uh, John introduces his gospel in chapter one by saying, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jehovah Witnesses actually say, they look at the original Greek and they say there's no definite article. So they say it should read in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. That's how Jehovah's Witness would read it. He was a God and the Bible says they will say, that um, David says, we are gods. So they're equating Jesus to a human who is given the title of God with a little g. But the construction of the Greek text in John chapter 1 definitively states that Jesus is on the same level as God. He's an equality of person and he is the same as God. But then verse 14 of chapter 1 says, uh, the word God was made flesh. And Paul says in Corinthians, the mystery of godliness is absolutely great, that God became flesh. Now, you know, I've watched a movie called The Fifth Element with Bruce Willis. Some of you who like movies, uh, some of these movies would have, may have watched it. And in this movie, uh, uh, The Fifth Element, um, you have this supreme being who comes to Earth and, um, and saves the planet, essentially. I can't go through the whole movie right now saves the planet but jesus can you imagine god compresses himself into jesus and enters our world as a baby and john the beloved disciple is fascinated and begins to write i can see him with his with his quill and he's writing those original words in the beginning well what beginning well, we know that there's a beginning in Genesis chapter 1. But he's saying when it all started, God was there. And Jesus is God. And God came to our planet. So the book of the Gospel of John is really a description 
of God interacting with human beings. And when we see the miracles, we call them miracles in the Gospel of John, each miracle really is a sign. It's a sign of or a teaching uh, a symbol. It is to instruct us. We can go through each one. The first one is uh, the water turned to wine. What is Jesus teaching? You remember Jesus says to his mother, uh, when she says they have no wine, Jesus' response is not, oh, well, they better go to the shop and buy some, or, you know, I've got some extra money. No, Jesus' response is, my time has not yet come. What's that got to do with wine, Jesus? Well, Jesus straight away sees wine as the red, the, with the redness of blood, and he sees it as his mission to spill his red blood, his wine to transform and to forgive and to restore. That's how Jesus, so this, the miracles or signs are teaching mechanisms through the book of John. And they build up. Each time a miracle comes, it builds on the last one until they reach a crescendo in John chapter 11. Remember? The miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. All right. So let's just backtrack a little bit. Let's go straight back to verse five, uh, to chapter five. I'm just going to reread the text. John chapter 5 and verse 6. And this is what it says. When Jesus saw him, saw him lying there, and knew that he had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? So you know the context to this story, right? You know that... Um, there was chapter 5, verse 1, in uh, Jerusalem, there was a pool, um, there was a, a five sort of columns, large columns, and over these columns were draped um, a covering uh, to stop the, the hot sun beating down on the heads and the bodies of the people who were within this sort of colonnaded area. And then the, the Bible tells us in, in, in John chapter 5, the people who occupy that area and i'm gonna just let me just read it um, and it says um verse three in this area lay a great multitude of sick people what the, john chapter five first five or so verses they are creating a plot they they john wants us to picture a scene and don't forget miracles in john or signs are teaching us something it's not just about someone getting well someone being able to see someone who was once dead now living they're all teaching us they're, they're calculated to teach us something about god coming into earth yes Father. so let's get the plot first of all we have a pool and around this pool you have five columns. I don't know what they're made from. Marble, brick, stone, wood. Five columns. And above the columns, you have a covering. And the covering is to stop the heat from harming the people who are under the, that, 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 um, that covering. And under the covering, we have a mass of people. And they're all sick. But they have varying degrees of sickness. Some are crippled. Some are paralyzed. Some are blind. But they're all sick. Mm. So we have uh, um, uh, the name of the area is called Bethesda, and that means house of mercy. So listen to and see the plot again. We have a bunch of sick people in an area called the house of mercy. Mm. And they're all waiting for something to happen. They look towards the water, verse 4, and we are told that at a certain season, every now and then, the water began to bubble, 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 and rise. And um, whoever jumped into the pool first would be healed of their sickness. Now, I just want to let us know, listen, verse 4 is not in the original, uh, in, in the earliest manuscripts of the new testament of the, the 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 record of john it's not there verse four is not there verse four listen listen verse four 
says that an angel went down into the pool. So that, that comment is not there in the original. In the earliest manuscripts, it's, it's in some of the later manuscripts, but not in the earliest manuscripts. And you know, we would say that the earlier the manuscript, the more authentic the manuscript. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but when you look at verse 7, um, you see that the, the, the sick man is saying to Jesus, you know, no one's there to stir up the water. And so there was a belief that grew up that an angel came into the water and stirred up the water. And this is why the scribe has inserted this verse, this explanation in verse 4, that an angel came down. And when you read Desire of Ages, Sister White says that it was the belief that an angel came down and stirred up the water. You know, um, uh, I've been to Turkey on holiday, and um, there are some mineral baths in Turkey. And you go into that mineral bath, and you cake up yourself in mud, or someone cakes you up in mud, and, um, and in the mud you've got certain minerals, and you get into that hot water, you know, it, it smells a bit sulfuric, and, 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 and it does good for you. You know, I don't know about the, the respiration system, but at least for your skin. And um, water in the Bible, you know, there's, there's lots of stories of water and, and um, uh, stories that uh, water brings healing or, or is related to healing. You re re remember Naaman in the dirty Jordan River um, and he dips seven times and he becomes clean. And um, we remember uh, uh, um, uh, Elisha's time. Elisha uh, takes some uh, a tree and throws it into the water. Oh, I think that was Moses throws in the water. The water becomes pure. Remember, you remember that story. And um, uh, the people can drink and not die. Water and the in the Bible, significance. So we have the plot. The house of mercy. A lot of sick people. The water being troubled. Someone jumping in, and you get healed. But we also have something else in the story that I need to mention. Verse 2. It says that the pool was near an area by the sheep gates. You know, Jerusalem had many gates. And there was a gate in which the sheep would enter. And the sheep entered for one purpose. To be sacrificed. So we have a, a plot. John is telling us. We have a sheep gate where sheep come in to be slaughtered. We have a pool of water where people can go for cleansing. We have an area called the House of Mercy. And then we have a man called Jesus. You can see the plot. I can almost see John smiling as he's saying someone's going to get the plot in the plot. Because Jesus is the lamb who comes into Jerusalem as it were, through the sheep gate. And he comes to bring healing. But here's a crazy thing. The Bible says that the man who was healed had been sick for 38 years. We know that um, the book of John covers at least three and a half years. We know the ministry of Jesus began when Jesus was about 30 years, according to Luke. So um, Jesus, by the end of John, would have been about 33 and a half years old. So the man who was sick had been sick for longer than Jesus had been alive on earth. So when Jesus was born, the man had been sick for at least four and a half years. He had been an invalid for about four and a half years. When Jesus went to the temple, when Jesus was 12, the man was there, a sick man, and Jesus was there, and but Jesus never healed him. So I want to ask a question. Why is it that Jesus waited 38 years for the man to get well? And Jesus could have healed the man before. Or oh, why did he wait 38 years? Now, this is where I, I request a response. So my brother, please unmute everybody. And tell me what you think. Let's, let's have a discussion. Hmm. 38 years. You know, Jesus walks in, sees him sick, leaves him. Tell me, what do you think? Let me let me make it more um, pronounced here. 
I'm going to ask, um, let me start with Elder Lawrence. I know you're a co-host. Elder Lawrence, tell me what you think. Why did Jesus wait? Um, well, usually the timing wasn't right. I'd say the timing for the people around to see and appreciate Jesus's works wasn't right until uh, he was more of an adult. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Beverly Berry, do you have any thoughts on that one, Beverly Berry? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, all right, Beverly. All right, thank you, thank you. Clarence, I know you have a thought on everything, Clarence. Tell do me. I? <laughs> Clarence, tell me. Well, you it's all see. very relative, isn't it? Because you say, when, why did Jesus wait? Of course, I mean, our um, perception of wait is um, probably not the same. Well, it's clearly not the same as Jesus. So, I mean, that's that. That's one of several situations where Jesus had done things. When, as far as humans are concerned, it wasn't in their time the right time. Jesus, on some occasions, he even allowed. When I say he waited, as it were, people have died, but he had a message in that process because the message was actually having waited. Um, he was he was he was going to heal Jairus's daughter, for example, and um, along the way, you know, given that his father was his, the father of the child was saying that you need to hurry, but he still waited and hung around and did some other important things and still did what he had to do. So for me, I don't know if um, there's a difficulty um, with waiting because in Jesus's own time, there's a purpose for what he does. Clarence, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, controller, please mute everyone again, please, and, and I'll continue. So, um, Jesus waits and waits 360 Jewish days in a year. So he waits 360 days in year one, year two, and this man is in the, this pool the near this pool and the man for 360 days of the year is trying to crawl trying to shuffle himself you know years ago there used to be a dance uh, a dance move that i don't know what it's called but you know you could sort of move like this your body could move like this and i just imagine that this man um is trying every trick every antic every procedure every every twist, every turn, to, to try and get to the water's edge to find healing. And this tells me that, um, that in this world of sickness and sin, in this world of sin and sickness, we all as sinners gravitate to something to make us feel better. It may not be a pool of water, it could be education. I'm not just talking the church, I'm talking the world of, of sinners and sickness. You know, it could be um, alcohol to make us feel better. It could be illicit relationships, it could be sex, illicit sex. It could be uh, um, money, the acquisition of money. It could be the acquisition of education and power and control. Whatever it may be, we gravitate. It could be fashion, it could be clothing. We gravitate to something to make us feel better in this massive environment called the world and i want to just um, pull out from the plot and introduce the idea that this world is now classed as the house of mercy in which we live it's a house of mercy it may not look like a house of mercy but it's a house of mercy and what i want to say is um the what I want to say is the, the um, Jesus is in the house of mercy. Listen, the house of mercy in John chapter 5 wasn't really a full house of mercy, you know, because you've got, um, sorry, one moment, one moment. Uh, I need to open a door so my reception will not die. Oh, okay, thank you. Jesus comes to the house of mercy in Bethesda. The house of mercy is not fully a house of mercy. It's called a house of mercy, but it's not fully a house of mercy because only the strongest will survive. 
a bit like the world in which we live. The stronger seems to be the ones who survive. The one with power seems to be the successful ones. But I'm so grateful that Jesus is in the house of mercy. Jesus is in the house of mercy. And he has a different take on situations. So Jesus comes along, sees the man. And I, I, I'm fascinated by some of the comments Jesus made because I, I don't know if this was the right comment to make, but Jesus says to the man, well, on face value, it doesn't seem to be, you know, do you want to be made well? You know, if, if I was the man, right, listen, <laughs> 38 years, my hopes have been dashed and he's sick because of his own sin. We know this because we read later, Jesus finds him in the temple worshiping God. Jesus says to him, don't sin again in case a worse thing come upon you, which implies, and Sister White in Desire of Ages expands and says, it was a result of his own sin. But here, here's the man. Physically ill, mentally restricted, conscience grieved and beaten by his own sin in the past that has caused his current condition. And a man bends over, but I love the way Sister White says it. She says, the man heard the most melodious voice speaking to him. Do you want to be made well? He, he heard it. You know, I still think, I thought, what kind of question is that? You, you can evidently see I want to be made well. If you've been hanging around here long enough, you see me struggling. So the man doesn't say to Jesus, Yes, I want to be made well. The man says, mm, boy, I have no one to help me. Because every time I try to get in, someone stronger than me steps over me and gets in and they're well. The man doesn't, the man doesn't even ask Jesus for help. Can you see something developing? Jesus knows our need before we even articulate it. Mm. He's been watching us all our life long, 38 years, 42 years, 27 years, 12 years, 55 years, 57 years, 56. He's been watching us all our life long. 365 days of the year, Western year, Julian calendar, watching us all our life long in this house of mercy, this world, that administers unfair justice. But Jesus is here. Let's conclude the story. The Bible says that Jesus said to man, do you want to be made well? And then Jesus says to the man, after hearing the man's explanation, and you know, Jesus asks questions, not because he needs information. He asks questions so he can get recognition we can recognize where we are remember the first question jesus asked in the garden called eden where are you who told you you were naked yep, jesus knows jesus knew where they were darkness is light to him so no matter how big the trees were they couldn't hide the naked adam and eve jesus simply asked a question so that he can get an acknowledgement so we know what time it is where we're at Oh, I was naked. Who told you were naked? Oh, the woman you gave me, but you know the story. Mm. And sometimes questions can be so painful, so revealing. Remember Elisha, uh, uh, after he healed Naaman, after the Lord healed Naaman, and um, Gehazi, the servant, runs off to get the, you know, to, to try and get some of the um, the loot for himself, you know, some of the riches that Naaman has, and he, he brings it back. The Bible describes him coming back with all this stuff. And he hides it in his house and he runs and he stands in front of Elisha. And Elisha says to him, hmm, where have you been, Gehazi? <laughs> where have you been? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say to Gehazi, I saw you, you know. Where have you been? 
And remember Peter did the same thing when Ananias and Sapphira came into him? Hmm. Why have you conspired to lie to the Holy Ghost? Hmm. Questions. So this man, we don't know his name, he gives Jesus an explanation. I can't get in, no one's there to help me. Then Jesus responds, man, how blessed must I have been to hear those words of Jesus. You know, remember John chapter one calls him the word of God. And the word now speaks. And the, the ears of the man, because he, he can hear, you know, there's, there's something okay with him, but not everything, you know. And some of us have, something's okay with us, but not everything. But Jesus uh, just opens his mouth. What a beautiful, beautiful voice that must have sounded like. One, one of him writers says, his voice is like the sound of the dulcimer. The sweet, the dulcimer is an ancient instrument. has a deep, beautiful, uh, voluptuous, encouraging, restorative sound. And um, his voice, like the sound of the dulcimer, sweet, says the songwriter, is heard uh, through the channels of death. And the seed of the Lebanon bow at his feet. The air is perfumed by his breath. And this, this man whose hearing works, hears the words. Arise, take up your bed and walk. Listen, let me share with you from Desire of Ages, how Sister White describes it. She says this. Jesus does not ask this sufferer to exercise faith in him. Sometimes we say, oh, Lord, I don't have any faith. Oh, help me. Help my faith. Help my unbelief. Help my faith to grow. Titus says, um, Paul says to Titus, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. John says that um, God has put within each of us a light. So there's a measure of faith in every person on planet Earth. There's a measure of faith. Let me explain it like this. A magnet has two sides, two poles, negative and positive. We, human beings, are the negative pole. Jesus is the positive pole. There is always going to be an automatic attraction when the circumstances are correct, where we, in whatever condition or situation we are in, will always be attracted to the positive pole in Jesus. Let me explain. The, um, uh, the, the prodigal son was in a pig pen. To all intents and purposes, when you observe it on the outside, smell of pig, maybe he was looking like a pig. He was maybe even sounding like a pig because he was definitely going to eat like a pig. But he responded to the positive pull of Jesus in a pig pen. So there's always something in us. That's why drunk people can respond to the, to the word of the Lord. And way back in creation, God put it in us. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. I've heard one person, one preacher explain it like this. God is going to put within us an unnatural uncomfortableness with sin. We know when things are not right. Let me continue. Desire of ages. Jesus simply says to the man, rise. I want to say it like this. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. These are limbs muscles, sinews, and nerves that had had no movement, effective movement, for 38, at least for 38 years. Listen to this, desire of ages. But the man's faith takes hold upon that word. Every nerve and muscle thrills with new life and healthful action comes to his crippled limbs every nerve do we have any doctors or nurses with us today in in bilston church or anyone listening any doctors nurses clarence do we have any i can't hear you unmute unmute Clarence, do we have any doctors or nurses in our midst today? 
No, I can't hear you. So, I'm a nurse. Oh, you're a nurse. All right. Sister, what's your name? Dorothy. Dorothy, that's my sister's name. Dorothy, Dorothy let me ask yeah. you, I don't know if you know, but do we have, I, I think you do know the answer to this, do we have different um, categories of nerves in the human body? Is that again? Do we have different categories of nerves in the human yeah. body? We yeah. do. And can you describe, you know, one category of nerves? Um, can smell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so movement. Uh, the what? Sorry. Movement. Movement. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. So we have some categories of nerves called sensory nerves. Hmm. And we have some uh, um, which are sort of automated nerves. So they will automatically respond without us consciously causing them to, 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 um, to respond. So, for instance, we have cardiac nerves, which are involuntary. They just work without us thinking. We don't have to think, right, I need to make my heart beat. It beats. <laughs> but sensory nerves, um, Dorothy... Just slap your husband's head, not too hard. Slap his head. <laughs> I, I, I didn't see it. But if you did slap his head, um, his sensory nerves picked up your slap. Sensory nerves, and they transported that feeling to his central nervous system via axons, nerve cells, and uh, to his brain. And if it hurts, then uh, other nerves would have sent a message to his muscles to make a reaction and then to move his neck, to move his head away from your hand to prevent further harm. Nerves. You know, in the human body, there are over, listen to me, there are over seven trillion nerves. Over seven trillion nerves in our body. There are long nerves, like our longest nerve is a sciatic nerve. You, we, some of us have felt sciatic pain, sciatica. And the shortest nerve is in our ear, a cochlear nerve. You know, if we were to take all the nerves in our body and stretch them out, join them to end to end, they would, they would cover about 45 miles. 45 miles of nerves in our body. And some of us are only five foot four. <laughs> Can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. But I, I was baffled by this because when I, I heard about uh, seven trillion nerves in the human body, I don't even know exactly what a trillion is. So I had to do some research. You know, I, I, fig I, 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 I knew what a trillion was, you know, because I read about a trillion. I read that a trillion is, let me talk about a billion. A billion is 1,000 million. Mm. So I've got 1,000 lots of million pounds. A million pounds, but I've got 1,000 of them. Man, I, I, what an experience to have a billion. <laughs> hmm. But a trillion is 1,000 billion. Let me break this down, because I had to understand what a trillion is. So... One person has put it like this. If you were to receive a, a million pounds a day and to spend a million pounds a day and, the, and you started spending from the time of Jesus, that's 2,000 years ago, a million pounds a day, you would still have to spend for another 725 years from now to get rid, to almost get rid of a trillion pounds. But we have over seven trillion nerves in our body. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Sister White says it like this in Desire of Ages. She said, every nerve and muscle thrilled with new life and healthful action came to his crippled limbs. So, I'm going to have to end now, but I just want to say this. I'm going to say it like Ellen White says it. Let me read it. Let those desponding, struggling ones look up. The Savior 
is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds the soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. Desire for Ages, chapter 21. Remember, we started off by talking about a plot. You know, this house of mercy, you know, the, the sheep gate through which the sheep came, you know, pool of water, the sick masses of people, and Jesus. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1 says this, that the Lord will open up a fountain for healing, healing from sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13 verse 1. And Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13 says this, if the ashes of a heifer Sprinkling the unclean person could clean. Let me explain wh what we're talking about. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, uh, we see the word a heifer, which is a, uh, a cow. When you read in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, um, the, the Moses instructed the Israelites to get a red heifer. It had to be a red heifer. A red one. That's an unusual color. And I just want to let you know, researchers say that from the time of Moses to the time of the, the uh, temple, there were only nine red heifers. Only nine. The Jews, when they examined the heifer, if there was one hair that wasn't red, the heifer was discounted. But in the book of Numbers, a red heifer is introduced. The red heifer is to be uh, ritually sacrificed and um, body burnt, and, and the ashes were to be kept. And what would happen if someone um, had sinned or had an incurable disease? Uh, water was to be poured on the ashes, and then the water then would be sprinkled, that ash, sodden water would be sprinkled on the sufferer or the person was unclean, and then they would pronounce clean. So and in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13, Paul takes up the idea, and he says, if the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean person, could cause purity of body. How much more? Listen, and we go back to the plot in John chapter 5. How much more will the blood of Christ, you know, what? The sheep gate. Here comes the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, the spirit who was there at creation, sacrifice himself, shed his own blood, remember? Shed your own blood. How will it, it, it will purge our consciences? Conscience, conscience. This man had committed sin himself for 38 years, conscience killing him with negativity, blaming. How much more will the blood of Christ cleanse our conscience, purge our conscience from dead works? And that's Satan's plan to always pull us back to the old time things we used to do. Hebrews 9, verse 13 purge our conscience from dead works and cause us to serve the living God, to serve the living God, which is our duty. God never made us to be crippled. He made us to stand up, to get up and to serve him. He's a living God forever and ever and ever. Thank you, Bilston and friends for listening. The sermon has come to an end. I almost feel we need a part two and maybe a part three. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful, listen to me, I'm grateful that the Lord has rescued me because I am not immune to falling and sinning. This event occurred on Sabbath, where Sabbath keepers were critical of the man 
and said, put down your bed. How dare you carry your bed on the Sabbath? But they didn't know that the power of the Almighty had transformed the man on the inside and said, get up and walk, carry your bed. Mm. The Sabbath is supposed to be a day of delight. And Jesus made a day of delight. Listen, brethren, I wish I could hug you all. It's been a blessing. I've been blessed. I don't know about you all. I know you have, but still, I just want to say it. <laughs> I've been blessed today. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes, I've been blessed today. Amen. Because the real mercy, Amen. Man, Amen. The, real, the real mercy man is in the house of mercy, this world, unfair as it is. And he tells us, don't wait until we feel better. Listen out for his words. Because if we catch just one word from Jesus, get up, forget the past, press forward to the things which are in front of you. I have called you to serve your Father in heaven. So let's do that with joy. Amen. Bilston brethren and brethren, um, it's been a blessing this morning. We know God is alive. Because God uses weak, fallen sinners like <clears throat> us to communicate restorative truth to all of us. Don't wait to feel that you're better. Don't wait to worry if you've got faith, because you already have. Just hear his voice. Grab hold of him with your faith fingers and believe his word. Don't go back into sin, but take time to be holy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for coming into this so-called house of mercy, but bringing your brand of mercy, which is amazing. Lord, we pray that as we go through the rest of this Sabbath that you have blessed and set aside for our benefit, that we will continue to be showered with your blessing. Everyone, Lord, who attended today, May they receive your spirit, hear your voice, and live your life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just wish you all a happy Sabbath to one and all. Have a blessed week until we shall meet again. Take care, one and all. Amen. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Amen. Okay.